Good evening, everyone. My name is Nate Robb. I'm the Youth and Family Program Manager at the Senator John Hines History Center. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for a program called Trailblazing Women in Journalism, The Legacy of Nellie Bly. We appreciate you being here tonight for a program that celebrates the 130th anniversary of the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh and the accomplishments of pioneering journalism, especially Nellie Bly. I want to share a few notes about the program tonight. We are in a Zoom webinar format. You can reach us if you need any help using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We also have live captioning provided by ACS Captioners. You can access that by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. That will be available throughout the whole evening. We'll have a portrayal of Nellie Bly, followed by a discussion by Dr. Candy Carter Olson. If you have any questions for Dr. Olson, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit them for our question and answer section towards the end of the program. The Detry Library and Archives at the History Center is proud to hold a strong collection of materials from the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh, including fascinating correspondence, meeting minutes, membership lists, photographs, and more that documents the club's activities from 1891 through its 100th anniversary in 1991. Student Writing Competition Committee reports, a history of the Women's Press Club prepared by a longtime member, and materials that document the club's support of the Gertrude Gordon Memorial Fund can all be found within the collection. In addition to celebrating the 130th anniversary of the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh, this program is also part of the History Center's Women Forging the Way initiative, which tells the stories of women in and from Western Pennsylvania. We have been telling Nellie Bly's story over the past few months through a blog from University of Pittsburgh student researcher and History Center intern, Lawson Pace, programs for youth and families, at-home activities, and on social media. You can learn more about the History Center's Nellie Bly project at www.heinzhistorycenter.org slash Nellie Bly. I want, to think, I want to turn things over to Stacey Federoff, president of the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh. Thanks so much, Nate. And hi, everyone. Thank you first to the History Center for reaching out and partnering with us, not only to celebrate Nellie Bly, but also to celebrate this milestone marked by the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh. Thank you also to everyone who is here tonight to celebrate with us. We truly appreciate your support. The Women's Press Club knows that it's important to celebrate the stories of our region and the trailblazers like Nellie Bly. We also celebrate all the generations of women in journalism that came after her and what they did to tell the stories of the Pittsburgh region through tragedy and triumph, the monumental moments and the everyday joys. As the famous quote goes, journalism is the first rough draft of history. And now many of the everyday stories that those generations of women wrote in their own time have become history in and of itself, which can help show us the way we should propel the region into the future. So for everyone gathered here, especially those who aren't journalists, I would hope that in supporting this event, you're not only supporting the efforts of organizations like the History Center, which remind us of the importance of where we came from, but that you remember to support the efforts of journalists who are telling our stories as they unfold today, every day here in Southwestern Pennsylvania. All that said, I personally feel that I owe a debt of gratitude to all the past leaders of the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh who have come before me and wanna take a special moment to recognize them. Because in leading the Women's Press Club and bringing together the women who have told the stories of our region for so many decades, they've also helped to build the journalism community into what it is today. And as a Pittsburgh journalist, particularly a woman working in, as a journalist, that is something for which I am truly grateful. Um, in these times where certain aspects of our lives seem to be dominated by division, I'm always proud of the work of the Women's Press Club that contribute to a more collaborative and supportive environment, especially for other women. Lastly, I'm grateful for the support of Allegheny County. And I would like to read to you the proclamation that was issued to the Women's Press Club 
for this special day. Whereas the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh, the second oldest women's press club in the nation, is celebrating its 130th year of providing a source of fellowship, networking, and education for women in the news media, including journalists, writers, editors, photographers, broadcasters, public relations professionals, and supporters at a vital event, a virtual event being held on February 4th, 2021. And whereas the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh was founded in 1891 by seven newspaper women who are among the early female media professionals to persevere through indifference and gender-based criticism of their work. Together, Kara Reese, Virginia D. Hyde, Jane Mulhern Coward, Belle McElhaney, Kathleen Husey Watson, Clara M. Walmer, and Carolyn L. Weatherell paved the way for women in the Steel City to share ideas, communicate concerns about their professions, and celebrate their dedication to searching for the truth and telling the stories of the Pittsburgh region. And whereas, striving to honor its past and forge into the future, the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh strives to provide a place for women in the news media through a variety of educational programs and networking events, partnering with fellow media organizations for events and collaborating with cultural institutions and nonprofits in the area to broaden its impact and enhance its membership's experience. And whereas, in celebration of its 130th anniversary, the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh is partnering with the Heinz History Center to posthumously induct trailblazing journalist and Western Pennsylvania native Nellie Bly as an honorary member during the event. And whereas, in perhaps the most impactful piece of the group's advocacy for the field, the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh partners with Point Park University for its Gertrude Gordon Memorial Fund Scholarship Contest for college students to support the next generation of storytellers and encourage them to pursue this imperative profession. Given the ever-changing media landscape faced by news professionals, the mission of the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh is as important today as it was more than a century ago when the organization was founded. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, County Executive Rich Fitzgerald, by virtue of the authority vested in me, do hereby proclaim February 4th, 2021, as Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh Day in Allegheny County. We congratulate the organization on reaching this special milestone and we wish it many more successful years to come. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the County of Allegheny to be affixed this fourth day of February, 2021, Rich Fitzgerald. And so the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh would like to confer its own exceptional recognition to Nellie Bly for her contributions as a Pittsburgh woman in journalism and for the legacy that she represents in uncovering stories fearlessly that blazed a trail and captured the imaginations, not just of journalists, but of people everywhere who want to take on a challenge and rise above it. Thank you, Stacy, for inducting me into the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh, which has been bestowed to me upon my return from a worldwide adventure. It is an honor to be part of this organization, especially because it is in the city where I got my start in journalism. As you probably know by now, I just returned to New York a few days ago on January 25th from my most recent project. This one, of course, was inspired by Mr. Vern's Around the World in 80 Days. I'm speaking now outside of the Sixth Street Bridge that connects Pittsburgh to the old Allegheny City, where my mother once ran a boarding house. Tonight, I want to share a few of my reflections on the journey around the world and other projects I have undertaken in journalism. My editors at the New York World were very reluctant about my most recent assignment. It took them nearly a year to come around to my suggestion of trying to beat the record of Phileas Fogg's and Passporto. 
I was repeatedly told that because I am a woman, I would need a protector, so it would be impossible for me to travel alone and that I would need to carry so much baggage that it would be similarly impossible for me to make rapid changes between trains, ocean liners, and the like. When they did come around to the idea, they wanted me to leave in two days. I can start this minute, I said when they finally said the assignment was mine for the taking. My heart was beating rapidly. They wanted me to take the ocean liner, city of Paris, but I convinced them that I would take a different one, the Augusta Victoria, which left the following day. The day they asked me to undertake the project, I went to Gormley's, a fashionable dressmaker, and ordered a new dress. I knew that getting traveling clothes would be a challenge, but I also firmly believe that nothing is impossible if one applies a certain amount of energy in the right direction. Thus, I knew it would happen in the end. This idea has been important to me throughout my career and I've provided it true several times over. I placed my order at Gormley's, being clear that I wanted a dress by that evening and that it would stand constant wear for three months. The dressmaker did not appear to become nervous or hurried. He kept up a lively and half humorous conversation while I was fitted for it. When I returned at five o'clock for the second fitting, the dress was finished. I considered this promptness and speed a good omen and keeping with the project. I've been asked very often since my return how many changes of clothes I took in my solitary handbag. Some have thought I took but one. Others think I carried silk, which occupies far less space, and others have asked if I did not buy what I needed from the different ports. One never knows the capacity of an ordinary hand satchel until dire necessity compels the exercise of all one's ingenuities to reduce everything to the smallest possible compass. In mine, I was able to pack two traveling cups, three veils, a pair of slippers, a complete outfit of toilet articles, ink stand, pens, pencils, and copy paper, pins and needles and thread, a dressing gown, a tennis blazer, a small flask, a drinking cup, several complete changes of underwear, a liberal supply of handkerchiefs and fresh ruchings, and most bulky and unencompassing of all, a jar of cold cream to keep my face from chapping in the varied climates I would encounter. That jar of cold cream was the bane of my existence. It seemed to take more room than everything else in the bag and was always getting into just the place that would keep me from closing the satchel. Over my arm, I carried a silk waterproof, the only provision I made against rainy weather. After experience showed me that I had taken too much rather than too little baggage, at every part where I stopped, I could have bought anything from a ready-made dress down, <laughs> except possibly at Aiden. And as I did not visit those shops, I cannot speak from knowledge. On Thursday, November 14th, 1889, at 9.40 and 30 seconds o'clock, I started my tour around the world. Of course, you know I successfully completed my journey. I enjoyed spending time with the Augusta Victorian's captain and my fellow traveling companions across the Atlantic. I had not known of the passengers when I left New York seven days before, but I realized when it was time to separate from them that I regretted the parting very much. They provided much comfort after my initial seasickness. After disembarking from the Augusta Victoria in Southampton, England, and taking a mail train through London, I took a ferry across the channel and made a detour to the city of Ames, where Mr. and Mrs. Verne live. Meeting Mr. Verne was the high point of the project. He, after all, was its inspiration. Mr. Verne did not speak very much English, and my French is quite limited, but we were able to converse through a translator. Mr. Byrne asked me what my line of travel was to be, and so I told them. My line of travel is to be from New York to London, Calais, Brindisi, Port Said, Ismailia, Suez, Aden, Colombo, Penang, Singapore, Hong Kong, Yokohama, San Francisco, New York. 
Why do you not go to Bombay as my hero Fogg did? Mr. Vern asked. Because I am more anxious to save time than a young widow, I responded, referring to the character and around the world in 80 days who becomes Fogg's traveling companion and love interest. You may save a young widower before you return, Mr. Vern said with a smile. I smiled with a superior knowledge as women fancy free always will at such insinuations. In my journey, I saw many ports that were colonies to the British, including Port Said, Egypt. I spent Christmas in Caton, purchased a monkey I named McGinley in Singapore, greatly enjoyed Colombo and Ceylon. Of course, along the way, Elizabeth Bisland undertook the same challenge going the opposite direction around the globe, which I only found out about when I was in Hong Kong. I landed in San Francisco and proceeded to take a train across the United States. It seemed as if my greatest success was the personal interest to everyone who greeted me. In Chicago, a cable which afforded me so much pleasure reached me, having missed me in San Francisco. Mr. Vern wishes the following message to be handed to Nellie Bly the moment she touches American soil. <clears throat> M and MME Jules Verne addresses their sincere facilitations to Miss Nellie Bly at the moment that intrepid young lady sets foot in the soil of America. It was after dark when we reached Columbus, where the depot was packed with men and women waiting for me. A delegation of railroad men waited upon me and presented me with beautiful flowers and candies, as did numerous private people. I did not go to bed until after we had passed Pittsburgh and only got up in the morning to be greeted by thousands of good people who welcomed me in Harrisburg. Where in Harrisburg, the Wheelman's Club sent me a flower offering remembering the time I spent as a wheelman. A number of Philadelphia newspaper men joined me there and at Lancaster, I received an enthusiastic reception. Almost before I knew it, I was in Philadelphia and all too soon to please me, for my trip was so pleasant, I dreaded to finish it. A number of newspaper men and a few friends joined me in Philadelphia to escort me to New York. Speech making was the order from Philadelphia to Jersey City. I was told when we were almost home to jump to the platform the moment the train stopped in Jersey City, for they made my time around the world. <laughs> The station was packed with thousands of people, and the moment I landed on the platform, one yell went up from them, and the cannons and the batteries of the Fort Greene boomed out the news of my arrival. I took off my cap and wanted to yell in the crowd, not because I'd gone around the world in 72 days, but because I was home again. This, of course, was only a few days ago, and I'm still considering how best to tell the story in full. <laughs> Perhaps... As with my other projects I have done, I will publish a book. There are many interesting antidotes from the project that I had to cut short at the count of time. On the 22nd of September in 1887, I was asked by the world if I could find myself committed to one of the asylums for the insane in New York. With a view of writing a plain and unvarnished narrative of the treatment of the patients therein and the methods of management and the like. Did I think I had the courage to go through such an ordeal as the mission would demand? Could I assume the characteristics of the insanity to such a degree that I could pass the doctors, live for a week among the insane without authorities finding out that I was just there for a story? I said I believed I could. I had some faith in my own ability as an actress and thought I could assume insanity long enough to accomplish any mission entrusted to me. Could I pass a week in the insane ward of Blackwell's Island? I said I could, and I would, and I did. My instructions were simple, to go on with my work as soon as I felt I was ready. I was to chronicle faithfully the experiences I underwent, and when once there were walls of the assignment to find out and describe the inside workings, which are always so effectively hidden by white-capped nurses, as well as bolts and bars from the knowledge of the public. We do not ask you to go there for the purpose of making sensational revelations. Write up things as you find them, good or bad, give praise or blame as you see best, and truth all the time. But I am afraid of that chronic smile of yours, said the editor. 
I will smile no more, I said, and I went away to execute my delicate and, as I found out, difficult mission. If I did not get into the asylum, which I hardly hoped to do, I had no idea what experiences would contain a simple tale of a life in the asylum. That such an institution could be so mismanaged and that cruelties could exist that I did not deem possible. I always had a desire to know asylum life more thoroughly. A desire to be convinced that the most helpless of God's creatures, the insane, were cared for kindly and properly. The many stories I had heard of abuses in such institutions I had regarded as wild accusations or even romances. After receiving my instructions, I returned to my boarding house and when evening came, I began to practice the role in which I was going to make my debut in the morrow. What a difficult task, I thought, to appear before a crowd of people and convince them that I am insane. I had never been near an insane person before in my life and had not the faintest idea of what actions were like. And then to be examined by a number of learned physicians who make insanity a speciality and who daily come in contact with insane people. How can I hope to pass the doctors and convince them that I was crazy? I feared that they could not be deceived. I began to think that my task was a hopeless one, but it had to be done. I started my plan at the temporary house for females, number 84, Second Ave. As I walked down the avenue, I d determined that once inside the home, I could do my best. I could get started on my journey to Blackwell's Island and the insane asylum under the name Nellie Brown. I needed to deceive strangers at a temporary home for females like Mrs. Kane, who had shown kindness to me but I was able to stay in my rule as soon as the officers of the law sent for me. Then I knew that I was making an advance towards a home of the insane. Are you Nellie Brown? asked the officer. I said, I supposed I was. Where do you come from? he asked. I told him I did not know and that Mrs. Stannard, the assistant matron of the temporary home for females gave him a lot of information about me told him how strangely I had been acting at her home, how I had not slept a wink all night, and that in her opinion, I was a poor and fortunate who had been driven crazy by inhumane treatment. That was some discussion between Mrs. Stannard and the two officers. I was taken to the Essex Market Police courtroom where the judge asked me questions about when I arrived in New York. I kept in my role and started shaking and looking around the courtroom. It was compiled of poorly dressed men and women with stories printed on their faces of hard lives of abuse and poverty. Everywhere there was a sprinkling of well-dressed, well-fed officers watching the scene passively and almost indifferently. It was only an old story with them. One most unfortunate added into a long list which had long since ceased to be any interest or concern to them. The judge continued his questioning. Eventually, he declared that, I wish the reporters were here. They wouldn't be able to figure out who you were. I got very much frightened at this. If anyone was to figure out the mystery, it's a reporter. I don't know what to do with the poor child, said the judge. She must be taken care of. Send her to the island, suggested one of the officers. Oh, don't, said Mrs. Tannard in an evident alarm. Don't, she's a lady and it would kill her to be put on the island. There have been some foul play here, said the judge. I believe the child has been drugged and brought to the city. Make out the papers and we'll send her to Bellevue for examination. Probably in a few days with the effect of drugs, she will be able to tell us her own story. Oh, I wish the reporters were here. I began to have more confidence in my own ability after a judge, a doctor and a mass of people had pronounced me insane. I went and was taken to the Bellevue Hospital in Blackwell Island and now felt confident that I could not fail. I was able to convince the staff at the hospital of my condition and was sent to the asylum itself where I stayed for 10 days. I made acquaintances with a great number of 45 women in Hall 6, including Louise, a German girl, who is regularly hurt by the staff. 
A French woman named Josephine came to the asylum because she spoke little English and it did not realize she was being asked why she was there. I was able to record many more of the stories of these women in the book, 10 Days in a Madhouse. It was so difficult to watch patients stand and gaze longingly towards the city that they will likely never see again. The insane asylum in Blackwell Island is a human rat trap. It's easy to get in, but once you're there, it's impossible to get out. I'd intended to have myself committed in the violent wards, the lodge and the retreat. But when I got the testimony of two sane women and they could give me, I decided it was too risky and I did not want to get violent. I had, towards the last, been shut off from all visitors. So when the lawyer, Peter A. Hendricks, came and told me that friends of mine were willing to take charge of me, I would rather be with them than in the asylums. I was only too glad to give my consent. I asked him to send me something to eat immediately on his arrival to the city, and then I waited anxiously for my release. I'd looked forward so eagerly to leaving this horrible place, yet when my release came, I knew that God's sunlight was to be free for me again. For 10 days, I'd been one of them. Foolishly enough, it seemed intensely shellfish to be leaving them to their suffering. I felt a desire to help them by sympathy and presence, but only for a moment. The bars were down and freedom was sweeter to me than ever. Soon I came across the river nearing New York. Once again, I felt like a free girl after 10 days in the madhouse of Blackwell's Island. My evidence was presented to a grand jury. I'm happy to be able to state as a result of the visit to the asylum and the exposure to constant thereon that the city of New York appropriated 100,000 more per annuum than ever before to take care of the insane. So I have at least the satisfaction of knowing that the poor unfortunates will be better cared for because of my work. Audiences in Pittsburgh will know my start in journalism and is at the dispatch. Shortly after my mother and I moved to Allegheny City from Cochran's Mills, I read the dispatch for the first time. At that time, they had a regular section called the Quiet Observer. One column was called What Girls Are Good For, and it had an incredible influence in my life. It, of course, called for a traditional role for girls, raising children, cooking, and cleaning houses. By now, you know enough of my biography to see how strongly I disagree with that perspective. I was determined to show my disgust and use my pen to express it. I paused at the end of the letter to the editors. What should I call myself? I did not want to use my birth name, Elizabeth Jane Cochran, as it continues to be a tradition in journalism for women to go by different names. Then it came to me. I would sign it a little orphan girl. Looking back at that fateful letter, I fully admit it was not well written. It clearly expressed my protest though, and caught the attention of George Madden, the dispatch editor. In response, the dispatch published an advertisement asking for the little orphan girl to reveal herself. Instead of writing a response, I decided to confront the dispatch editor face to face. When I did, he asked if I was a journalist and what would I wanna write about? My answer came quickly. I wanted to write about ordinary people, which has remained my, true throughout my career. George surprised me and offered me to write for the dispatch with my first project being focused on ordinary women. It helped me to learn the work of journalism and provided me with Nellie Bly, my pen name. At the dispatch, I first used the techniques of going undercover to tell stories to, about people who worked in Pittsburgh factories. The business leader, of course, did not appreciate me talking about this, so I was redirected into a more traditional topics for a while. <laughs> During this time, I learned that the railroads ran from Pittsburgh to Mexico City. I was able to convince George and the editors to send me there to report on the ordinary people of Mexico, even though I was only 21 years old. They insisted that my mother come with me. <laughs> I spent six months there learning about floating gardens, Mexican theater etiquette and talking to soldiers in the army before making a hasty exit for criticizing the arrest of a local journalist. 
Some of the early lessons and focus has stayed with me throughout my career. It is with great humbleness that I accept this offer of membership in the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh. I'm glad that uh, Nellie was able to join us tonight uh, and that we were able to offer membership to her uh, through the Women's Press Club. Uh, so I wanted to introduce our main speaker for tonight, uh, Dr. Candy Carter Olson. Uh, Candy Carter Olson is an associate professor uh, at Utah State University. Her research focus, uh, her research focus interests on women's press clubs as agents of change, news women's history, and women's use of social media to build community and organize activist groups. She is a 2018 Association for the Education in Journalism and Mass Communication Rising Scholar Research winner, and in the past received an American Association of University Women and American Fellowship, a Mountain West Center Research Grant, and an American Journalism Rising Scholar Award. She most recently published the 2020-18 co-edited volume Testing Tolerance, Addressing Controversy in Journalism and Mass Media Classroom, which is part of the AEJMC's Masterclass Teaching Series. She also co-edited Underserved Communities and Digital Discords, uh, Getting Her Voices Heard. She has published in Journalism and Mass Media Quarterly, the Journal of Communication Inquiry, Journalism History, American Journalism, Feminist Media Studies, Pennsylvania History, and media report to women. Additionally, she has co-authored a book chapter in the 2018 Mediating Misogyny, Gender Technology and Harassment. Carter Olson received her PhD in communication from the University of Pittsburgh. She is a past head of the Association for the Education and Journalism and Mass Communication Commission on the Status of Women. Candy? Thank you, Nate, um, and welcome everybody. Um, and more particularly, welcome to the club, Nellie Bly. You are an orphan girl no more. Um, you, the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh hopes that you enjoy becoming a member um, and joining us as part of our organization. Um, my slideshow is not working. There we go. Okay, so tonight we're going to celebrate the many strong, innovative, and daring women who have led both Pittsburgh's and the nation's newsrooms, but particularly the women who come from Pittsburgh and have been from Pittsburgh, because Pittsburgh has been a center of journalism historically in many different ways. And this tonight, we also celebrate 130 years of the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh, which, as Stacy mentioned, is the second oldest um, still running Women's Press Club in the United States. Okay, so first of all, Nellie, let's talk about what you did as a journalist that you left as a legacy for the people that, or for the women who came behind you. So first of all, um, Nellie, you wrote your first eight part series on our workshop girls for the Pittsburgh Di um, Dispatch. And it was so popular that it sold out the dispatch every day that it ran. This earned you a doubling of your wages and a promotion to the society pages, which was to you the dreaded ghetto of flower shows, home and beauty, which many of the women who come after you completely agree. Um, for your first story, about women factory workers in Pittsburgh, you asked a factory woman, girl who went to bars and drank with strangers, why do you risk your reputation in such a way? To which the girl answered, risk my reputation. I don't think I've had one to risk. I work hard all day, week after week for a mere pittance. I have no pleasure, no books to read. I cannot go to places of amusement for want of clothes and money and no one cares what becomes of me. And this kind of frankness marked all of Bly's reporting, whether it was in that dreaded ghetto or on the front pages. Your work became a reporting of the feminine condition in the 19th century. And your name became a synonym for adventurous newswomen from the Atlantic seaboard to the West Coast. 
that adventurousness became a way for women to not only defy the male dominance in the newsroom by proving that not only could women change, women could also take care of themselves. They could, in fact, use those qualities of womanhood that, quote, were being used as an excuse to bar women from city newsrooms, your femaleness, your vulnerability, to prove your own fitness for the newsroom, and in fact, to transform the newsroom and popular news writing as a whole. So you branched out to exposés of prison and factory conditions, and then took a trip to uh, Mexico to report on corruption there, which made you so unpopular that you were kind of ran out of the country on a rail. Um, the threat of another, you came back to Pittsburgh, and they threatened you with another turn on the women's pages because you were doing so well and that was a promotion for women. And rather than doing that, you decided to go to New York again without even a goodbye. And you left a letter, a letter on your um, editor's desk that said, Dear QO, standing for Quiet Observer, I'm off to New York. Look out for your naughty kid, Nellie Bly. As a journalist, you deliberately engaged in behavior that so directly contradicted social norms for women at the time that you had to defend your own womanliness. However, by adopting the hysterics hyper-female, hyper-expressive body, as we just heard about, you created your own story and claimed the right to tell it in your own way. And in this way, you set a stage for women journalists to come after you and embrace female norms and also break them in various ways so that women's stories, women's stories, women's ideas became a necessary part of every newspaper in the United States. So first of all, we're gonna talk about your sisters. But first of all, let's talk about your aunts, who are Bessie Bramble and Jane Gray Swiss Helm. You came from a, um, an area of the country that had already established some pretty well-known women journalists. So Jane Gray Swiss Helm, who is in the middle on the top up there, um, she was the only woman to cover Pittsburgh's Great Flood. And she's been called certainly the greatest literary figure of Western Pennsylvania among women. A record of Pittsburgh's gifted women that did not include her name would be woefully incomplete. On the other hand, she also earned, um, she was also reviled as that quote, horrible, awful woman who neglected her housework and wrote pieces for the press. It was a double-edged sword for women journalists. Bessie Bramble, who is on the upper left-hand corner of my screen, possibly right hand on yours, um, first was the first woman to join the men's press club in 1892. Before that, she'd already established herself as by writing witty pointed diatribes against school policies and leaders and divorce legislation. She firmly believed that women could, and more importantly, should do more housework and home improvements, um, do more than housework and home improvements. She advocated for women to run for their local school boards. And she said of the public woman, the more women can do and do know, the more attractive they become to men and the more they dominate their affections. So already you were coming from an area where women journalists were breaking the mores of what a woman should be. But coming up behind you, you established a type of reporting called stunt girl journalism, where you put yourself in the middle of the reporting um, and created a story around you. That led also into the next iteration of quote unquote women's journalism, sob sister journalism. Both of these types of journalism allowed women to break onto the front pages of the newsroom and to tell interesting stories about women's lives. So Gertrude Gordon um, here in Pittsburgh walked into a lion's cage and sat there and told the story about how she braved the lion. And she also got into a hot air balloon and flew across Allegheny County. All of those things 
made her your stunt sister um, niece. But she was also a sob sister and she embraced that term. She said, um, she said that, you know, the word is now obsolete, sob sister. It meant the girl reporter who covered the human interest side of the news. She described with the murderous war at the trial, the needs of the neglected children. And again, hear that these are all women's stories. The inside story of the divorcee. She gave the flair and color of public gatherings, the sidelights of fires, wrecks, floods, and other disasters. She was the repository of secrets, a cosmic shoulder for the public to lean upon, the throbbing link which bound the newspaper to its reader by personal interest, the element that providing the feeling of quote unquote you and me. And sob sister journalism became so popular that men journalists had to start adopting some of that same human interest to sell newspapers. So you set up a good way to revolutionize journalism altogether. Now down on the bottom here, I want to mention that our African-American women here in Pittsburgh also followed and became nationally known. So in the middle, um, well, I'm gonna mention one who's not pictured here. Her name is Evelyn Cunningham. Um, and she said, I especially like being a cold woman who's thrown in a group of well-meaners who honest to God want to help emancipate me because in the process, they give me the works that they don't even usually give their best friends. They try real hard to let me know that I'm socially acceptable, that they aren't the least bit repelled by me being in their homes. So Evelyn Cunningham wrote a column called The Women. And so she embraced being a woman's journalist, but she also acknowledged that African-American um, journalism had to also have racial advocacy as its underpinnings. And Hazel Garland and Toki Schalt Johnson, who are down here on the bottom, are also, um, also did the same. So Toki Schalt Johnson was actually the first black woman accepted into the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh, and she was accepted in 1961. However, she first applied for membership in 1949 with another Pittsburgh Courier journalist, but she was blackballed, which means that she, uh, little black ball was put into the net saying she could not become a member. In 1961, however, the club let her in with very little fanfare. By just being in the club, she forced the integration of the exclusive Duquesne Club by attending the club's annual dinner. In the middle down there is Hazel Garland, who actually saved the Pittsburgh Courier as its editor, and Toki brought her into the club. Um, and Hazel recognized that she was a leader particularly for African-American women. And she said, I just wanted to do the best job I could. I just wanted to follow in the giant footsteps, footsteps laid down before me by some of the greatest newspaper men in the history of journalism. I've always felt that Negroes deserve the best effort we can give them. And this I've always done. Just like others motivated, helped and assisted me. I've tried to do the same with other, especially all the young people coming through the doors at the Courier. I want to give back all the vast knowledge shared with me by some very, very great people. And what I've seen in studying the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh is that same desire to give back and to bring up people or other women behind them. And so in the 1950s and 1960s, the women reporters used the women's pages that they were at, that you called that dreaded ghetto and that were called the pink ghetto at the time. Well, they turned them on their head and they used them to keep reporting on, the, on women's causes. So Woody Merriman, one of the um, members of the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh, and um, the organizer of the McKeesport chapter of NOW, plus a reporter for um, the McKeesport Daily News and the Post-Gazette at one point in time. She went out and she did stunt girl reportage in the 1950s and 1960s. So she tried to get a line of credit in her name without her husband behind her. And she reported on who would give her credit and who would not. 
She also went out and she bought a nightgown and she wore it to a dance and reported on how many compliments she got on her fashionable attire. And in that way, satirizing fashion as a whole. She said of her job in the newspaper, because women were not expected to work at this point in time when they had kids and Woodin had four, she said it was kind of hard. People in my social set didn't do that. The women with kids, it was kind of hard on my husband because he was in management in the mill and the other guys would make comments like, you can't support your wife, eh? That kind of stuff. That's hard to believe today. However, women used the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh to educate themselves through literacy, producing a groundswell of new publications. And that was feminism in the 1960s and 1970s. Jill Daly, who is now retired, but was the health editor of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, um, said, I think everyone, especially young women, would benefit from some journalism experience because you kind of feel like you can get on the inside. You can find out what's going on and it makes you feel aware of the world. You feel more confident. In the 1970s, the women of the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh were breaking barriers in the sports world. So Paula Smith, who was one of the preeminent women uh, sports journalists of the 1970s, she was the first woman to go into the Pittsburgh Pirates Clubhouse in 1979. And yes, she dealt with a lot of sexual harassment to get there, but she said that was part of the job and she was making a way for the women behind her. And also Nancy C. Jones, who was also a sports reporter, but she was also the first woman professor of journalism at Penn State, and later a journalism professor at Point Park University. She said the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh was a place where women could support each other and move themselves forward. She said that she would bring students to WPCP meetings and have them inducted into the club. I was in instrumental with the young women in the colleges being members of this. And I think they understood that they needed the support of other women if they were going to go on to have a career. So Nellie, welcome to the club. And we're so happy to have you here. And I'm gonna leave you with these words that were written um, supposedly by Jane Grace Swiss Home, but, but actually by another member of the club for a skit um, at one of the annual, annual banquets. It says, your mission, mission, your sister help and uplift. Turn her eyes to the star, teach to steer, not to drift, till at last by the might of your heavenly gift, safe she reaches the bay through the rock's narrow rift. Nellie, you, your sisters, have helped and uplifted, and we thank you for that. Thanks, uh, Candy, for sharing that. Uh, we had one question uh, that popped up in the Q and A uh, feature. So, if you can, if you have anything that you'd like to ask uh, Candy, uh, you can use the Q and A feature right at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and the question that we got was, uh, "Could you tell us a little bit about Ida Tarbo? Do you know much of her story?" So yes, I do know about Ida Tar Tarbell. So the women that I actually mentioned are the women who were mentioned in the histories of the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh. Ida Tarbell was never brought up within the histories of the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh. So I was sort of staying within that particular of year. So, but yeah, Ida Tarbell, it's kind of hard to write a history of Pennsylvania journalism in particular without mentioning her and muckraking and investigative journalism and all of those things. She was an important voice. We can't overlook that. That's for gosh dang sure. Oh, absolutely. Uh, she's a fascinating uh, character, just like so many of the women journalism, women journalists were. Mm -hmm. Um. I am not seeing any other uh, questions in the Q&A feature. Um, so I think that we can turn things back over to Stacy uh, to talk a little bit more about the Women's Press Club. Yes. 
Nate, I actually want to give our scholarship chair, Nicole Chinoweth, a chance to tell everyone about our uh, other, our, our biggest enduring legacy uh, beyond um, uh, the professional women in journalism, but also supporting students. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you so much to the Heinz History Center for inviting the Women's Press Club to be a part of this inspiring evening. And Candy, amazing presentation. That was so fun. And I'm so excited to be here this evening to learn more about Nellie Bly's legacy. Um, as Stacy said, my name's Nicole Shinoweth. I'm the treasurer of the Press Club. And in keeping with tonight's message of the power of journalism, I'd like to take a minute to talk to you all about how the Press Club advocates for the next generation of Nellie Bly's. On February 21st, we'll host our 65th annual Gertrude Gordon Memorial Fund Scholarship Contest. It's named for one of the first female bylined reporters in Pittsburgh, and the competition challenges college students to interview a notable Pittsburgher and write a feature story on deadline about them. This year's interviewee is Allegheny County Council person at large, Bethany Hallam. The contest awards cash prizes to support the next generation of storytellers and encourage them to pursue the profession. For more than 20 years, Point Park University has hosted the competition. This year, Point Park will still host it, albeit on its Zoom account. If you know of any full-time undergraduate or undergraduate sophomores, juniors, and seniors at local colleges, Western PA residents, or attendees of Western PA, colleges or universities who might be interested in partic participating, I'll be sharing the link to the scholarship information uh, in the chat here. And if you are interested in supporting the scholarship fund itself, you can also donate um, to the fund via a, the Pittsburgh Foundation, which I'll share that link as well here in the chat. Um, you can also become a Women's Press Club member. Your membership dues directly uh, support the uh, programming that we do, and that includes the scholarship competition. So um, I will be sharing those links in the chat, and thank you everyone for joining this evening, and uh, it's been a pleasure getting to learn about the amazing Nellie Bly. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I just wanted to clarify, the scholarship contest is on February 19th. It is Friday morning. 9 a.m. Uh, we have uh, a good uh, group of students already registered. So we're looking forward to everyone who joins in uh, for that. But um, otherwise, uh, that's all from the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh. We hope that uh, some of uh, you who are interested uh, remain uh, our social media followers and uh, that we can see you again, whether it's at another virtual event or one in person someday. <laughs> uh, Candy, we had a few more questions come in. Uh, would you mind uh, chatting with us through this a little bit? Oh, sure. Um, and I also, I responded to Michelle and I don't think it actually got to you, but Michelle, I said, it's interesting that many women journalists actually in the 1970s, they were upset about um, the death of women's pages and the and it's turned into the lifestyle section because they lost so many jobs and they felt like um, they were being abandoned by the women's movement altogether, even though that was where they put the stories about women and the women's movements. Um, so it's interesting how feature writing even today is still considered soft or women's writing. So anyway, just some thoughts for you. Yeah, um, so one question that came through that I can address. Um, so someone asked if Nellie was related to the Cochran family in the automobile business. As far as I'm aware, I don't think she is. Uh, if she would be, it would be a very distant relationship. Um, our question for Candy, could you tell us a little bit more about the story of Gertrude Gordon and the Lions? Yes, I'm actually looking that one up for you um, really quickly. Um, um, and also, why wasn't Nellie Bly inducted in 1891? She didn't want to be. I mean, that 
uh, the seven women who started it, Nellie Bly was off. She was doing other things. Um, the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh, um, yeah, wasn't really on her, uh, her thing there. So let's see here. She, other things that Gertrude Gordon actually interestingly covered. Some of you may remember the old Willie Whitla kidnapping. She covered that. The Westinghouse strike, um, a coal strike and a mine disaster. She uh, toured the Northside brothels of the famous Madame Nora Lee. And she took a great circle trip through the Panama Canal to California. Why did she do the lions? Do you know, I, I, okay, so she was games travel anymore for a good story. And all I know that I've seen about this is she once even entered a cage filled with circus lions for that purpose to get a good story. Basically, she was just there like a stunt girl getting a good story, right? Um, interesting notes about her and um, Nellie Bly, actually. So Gertrude Gordon's weekly salary was $12. While some of her male counterparts earned $20 a week, Nellie Bly started at $5 an hour. And when she was done reporting, she was earning $25,000 a year, which in today's money is $700,000 a year. I had to look that up. Um, when I started at newspapers, I'm sure some of you are newspaper journalists. In fact, I know some of you here are. I was earning 20000 a year. So uh, Nellie Bly was doing pretty well for herself. Um, Nancy? I saw that you answered it in the chat, but I think it would be good to have it on video too. Uh, so what do you feel are the characteristics that have made Nellie Bly enduring and memorable? Okay. So definitely that she was willing to put herself in the middle of a story, which was a huge violation of norms for gender at that point in time. Um, she was also about making women's voices and abuses of women in particular, because there were many abuses of women, but women were just supposed to take it and be quiet. Um, she made them really public and out there. She also talked about women's health. The Madhouse story that um, we saw in the um, skit earlier, that really played to the idea that women were just hysterical anyway. There was no way there was one sane woman in the world. But by re revealing how abusive that particular more was, that particular idea was, she really made, um, she really forwarded the idea that, um, sorry, that, uh, you know, culture was abusive toward women and the culture of the time was abusive for women. And I see that coming out in women's writing throughout the 20th century. Um, by the way, for African-American women, if you're interested, um, Pamela Walk, who works at Duquesne University, is particularly digging into the histories of the, um, of the women of the Courier, and I want to call her out because that's some really interesting research going on. I do not know if Nellie Bly was out of African-American um, descent. From what I've seen, I do not believe so, but no. Um, her family was largely from uh, European. Uh, we can sp uh, specifically trace some ancestors to Ireland, uh, but elsewhere in Europe too. Yeah. Who would you say is the most significant influence to not launch Nellie's career and passion for writing? I mean, definitely her mom supported her education quite a bit. Um, and taught her to be really um, independent in many different ways. Um, so yeah, there's that. There's also her editor at the Dispatch. He supported her and ran her work, hired her, honestly, and gave her the idea that she could do this. All of us need somebody who believes in us and who gives us that chance. He gave her that chance and he saw something in her. So that's important. Um, and by the way, her mom went with her to Mexico. They didn't have a really great relationship, actually. Um, so it's kind of interesting that her mom was kind of that, fine, go ahead. 
Um, let's see here. Somebody asked, how did Nellie Bly feel about the women's suffrage movement? I actually don't know. Do you know anything about that, Nate? Uh, yeah, she was uh, a supporter of it. Uh, and in fact, not to be a total history center show, but there's a great article in the most recent uh, Western Pennsylvania History Magazine uh, that talks about Nellie, uh, Nellie Bly and Ida Tarbell and uh, suffrage kind of weaves throughout it and how they kind of ended up on slightly different sides of that story uh, at different points in time. Uh, but Nellie was definitely uh, a supporter of women's suffrage. Did we get them all, Nate? I think uh, we got them all. We had one more question that was probably best for Stacy. So I'm going to take this opportunity and say thanks again for joining us, Candy. Uh, we've really enjoyed having you on today. Uh, and Stacy, someone asked, how do you join uh, the Women's Press Club of Pittsburgh? Yes, I answered nancy thanks for asking that question um you certainly should visit our website wpcpgh.org and follow us on social media w wpcpgh on twitter and facebook and the membership we collect annual dues but we have lots of events every year uh discussions movie trips collaborations with other professional organizations um, and our big annual banquet where we award our scholarship winners, which is always fun. And we always have a, um, a uh, speaker uh, related to the journalism field. Uh, and uh, it's a nice, it's a great night when we can have it in person, so. <laughs> All right, well, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. And uh, that wraps up our program. Uh, we hope that you're able to uh, come to another program with the History Center or support the Women's Pre uh, Press Club in some way. All right, thanks again for joining us today. <laughs>